daughter is a big Frozen fan, so I couldn't help it. Um, let's get started. How um, how did 2.3 go? I'm hoping 2.3 was real short because it was the sheer life factor one. I'll say you're giving me this look. It's like because it's coming from you. I'm like I don't I don't fully believe it. But I'm on top of that. <laughs> Um, okay, um, I'm going to give you homework 2.4 today. I will tell you that 2.4 is maybe a little bit longer um, because 2.4 is taking what we've done in the past few assignments and stitching them together. Uh, and I'm really excited about today's lecture because of that because um, we're at the point now where we've done a lot of little stuff and it's time to start putting it together and do a full-blown assessment. Now, our topic of today is the analysis of tension members. And so when I use the term analysis in this class, I, it, is, it takes a slightly different meaning than what it would have taken last semester. So in last semester's class, uh, in structural analysis, what that would have meant is here's the structure. Let's apply equations of equilibrium. Let's apply um, uh, uh, you know, equations of equilibrium. Let's apply you know, uh, sum of forces, sum of moments to analyze the structure. I use the term analysis, maybe a better term is assessment, um, but the idea is that what we're gonna be doing now with tension members is we're gonna be saying, okay, here's a tension member, let's determine whether or not that tension member is effective in resisting the loads it's subjected to. So it's basically assessing a given uh, condition member, or uh, the condition of a given member. Um, that is what analysis means, uh, verifying its performance. If we understand how to do that, what we can then do is say, based on desired performance, what member should we use? And that's design. That's, that's what we're talking about with design. So we typically start with analysis and then move towards design. Um, and so I think you'll find this is pretty straightforward. Now these, this slide show, there's really not a lot new in here because a lot of this is just recap stuff that we've already talked about. But today, we're going to put it all together. So today, what we're going to do is actually Assess some full blown limit states. So, what we're going to be doing is comparing resistances to loads. Uh, and by that, I mean factored resistances and factored loads. And as long as the factored resistances are greater than the factored loads, uh, the member is safe. Um, so, we're going to be taking nominal resistances and adjusting them by resistance factors. We're going to be taking nominal loads and combining them using statistically calibrated load combinations. Um, these are our load combinations. And for today's example, we're really only going to need to look at these two, and really we're only going to need to look at one of them, because I think you'll be able to just observe that one's going to govern given the values uh, that are presented. Um, these are the limit states that we're going to be assessing. We've got two, well, two strength limit states and one surface limit state. Um, this is our uh, uh, limit state for gross section yielding and net section fracture. We are going to have an additional one for block shear. We'll talk about block shear later. Um, but for now, we're only assessing these two uh, for strength. Um, again, this screen capture, if you were to open up table 2-4 right now, this would look different because this is from the last manual. Um, but the general pattern is kind of the, the, the same. We're going to be looking at uh, FY and FU values for, for various grades of steel. Um, and whenever there's a range, remember you use the minimum, not the maximum or not the average. Um, we have our complete expression for net area. The example today is not going to have any stagger, okay? So the example today, we're going to be able to set that term to zero. We're not going to have any stagger associated uh, uh, with this W section connected by the flanges. But remember, we add an eighth of an inch to the bolt diameter to get the whole diameter. And we do that because we're adding a sixteenth of an inch twice. 1 16th for erection tolerance so that we can actually erect the structure and one for that little lip of damaged material around the, uh, uh, around the hole. Um, and then we have shear lag factors. Um, it is possible that multiple shear lag factors may apply to a given connection scenario. At a minimum, what you should be doing is assessing whether or not you're using case one or case two. Um, if case two applies, it's possible that there's something else beyond case two applies and again, this is another uh, uh, one that's worth bookmarking in your manual. Which, by the way, just to recap on bookmarks, uh, you know, I got a new manual this semester like everybody else. I'm sort of bookmarking along with everybody. And what I bookmark is for the shapes, I bookmark the W's, the, the channels, the angles, and the WT. So W, C, L, and WT. And then the only other bookmarks I have 
are the yield stresses and this. This is the only other thing I have bookmarked. So, um, and I think for your first exam, that's probably all you need. Um, we'll add to that, obviously, as the uh, uh, semester progresses. Okay, so today our focus is going to be this problem, okay? So I have a 40-foot long tension member. It is a W8 by 24 of A992 steel. And we're going to use that as a tension member, so we're taking this and we're yanking on it, okay? we got three-quarter inch diameter bolts. Um, here's the connection scenario, and we're going to ask if the member can safely resist service loads of 80 kips of dead load and 90 kips of live load. Now, I'm going to throw some, uh, I threw some terminology at you. I sort of snuck it in there. If I ever use the term service load, when I say service load, I mean a load that has not been factored, okay? So I would then take these loads and 1.4 dead, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live to factor them, okay? So there is a difference between service loads and factored loads, okay? So if I give you a factored load, you do not need to put it in the load combinations because the assumption is it has already been factored, okay? So I just throw that term service out there. I sort of snuck it in, but um, I wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay. All right. So let me break out the notebook here, and let's get to it. Okay. So I'm going to give everybody a sec to sort of copy all this stuff down because there's a lot going on here. Um, but um, in order to uh, do a steel design problem, one of the things that is sort of sort of the nature of the beast, as it were, is it takes a lot of data to start doing the problem. Like, for example, I know that the um, member is made of A992 steel, so I'm going to need some properties there. I know it's a W8 by 24, so I'm going to need some properties there. So a lot of times when you really start doing steel design, the first parts of the problem or the first part, first step of what it is you're doing is looking up a lot of stuff. And so that's just sort of um, the, the way it works. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through that process. Um, I'm going to scooch down here a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start looking up some, uh, some data here. So let's start off, um, let's start off with the fact that we know that we are dealing with A992 steel. Now we're dealing with A992 steel. What, what information can we glean from the fact that we are dealing with A992 steel? What can we get from that? What will that tell us? If I give you a grade of steel, what properties can you give me for that grade of steel? Well, okay, let's talk about that. So the modulus, the elastic modulus is 29,000 KSI, independent of whatever grade there is. But what we can get for a grade of steel is Fy and Fu. Okay, and so where do we get that, by the way? What table? There we go. So we're all going to turn, let me scooch up a little bit. We're all going to turn to table 2-4. And see, for you all that are trying to find it, watch this. Boom. You know what I mean? So it's, again, that's where these tabs are, are very, very valuable. I've, I've already found mine. Okay. This is a table, so it's on page 2-56. Um, this is going to be very used. Okay, so maybe here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll even, I'll go one step further here in, in the calcs and say page 2-56. Let me, oh, move that over a little bit. Move that over. Okay. So for grade A992 steel, is anybody able to tell me what is the yield stress? 65 KSI. Is that the yield stress? Is it 50? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, is it tensile stress? Yeah. Uh, 50 to 65? Yeah, 50, it's a range. So whenever there's a range, what do we do? Lowest. lowest. And what's the lowest? 50. And what is the ultimate tensile stress? Okay, boom. Okay, so we're going to need those values for this problem. Okay, now the other thing that we've been told is that this is a W8 by 24. Now, a W8 by 24 
has some dimensional properties to that. So let's find those, okay? So that's going to be in table 1-1, okay? Okay. Okay, now first off, let's find the W8 by 24. So can somebody tell me what page that's on? 1-28. 28. Okay. It's at the bottom. There we go. By golly, gosh, 28, what page 1-28, and it is the third from the bottom. Okay. Now, we are doing a tension member analysis problem. So I want somebody to tell me, in order to do this problem, is there a property of this W8 by 24 you think we're going to need? Yes. But, okay, area. All right. So what is the gross area of a W8 by 24? 7.08. Everybody able to find that? Everybody see that? Now... I, I left the schematic up here because I want to be clear about the, the, you know, the nature of the problem. Can anybody look at this schematic and tell me another property that they think we're going to need? What are, in order to do this problem, remember, we're trying to assess... What's that? Okay, we're going to need a radius of gyration. Now, what I'm going to do for that, okay, so that's right. What I'm going to do for that is I'm going to do, I'm going to look up Rx and Ry. Notice how there is not an Rz because the section has symmetry. So let's report both Rx and Ry. Okay. Um, so tell me what Rx is. 23. Nope. No, that's that's the section modulus. 3.42. 3.42 and 1.61. Uh, Does everybody see that? Everybody see that? Okay. Now, what I can tell you is that whenever you have a W section, RY is always smaller. I mean, W sections are meant to be bent upright. They're not meant to be bent the other way. And so you can tell because RY is always smaller than RX. So if we're doing slenderness calculations on W sections and you only reported RY, you wouldn't hurt my feelings. Okay. Some sections, that's not the case. Like WTs, that might not be the case. So you need to look up both. Um, but I just throw that out there. Okay. I want to get a little, before we get to slenderness, let's talk about the section. Um, we're going to need to compute gross and net areas. We're going to need to compute net areas. Is there a property of this W section we're going to need in order to be able to compute the net area? Flange the flange thickness. We're going to need T sub F. Okay? We are definitely going to need T sub F. Okay, what is the flange thickness for a uh, W8 by 24? 0 0.400. Again, use the decimal value, not the um, use the decimal value, not the fractional value. Is everybody good? Now, before we leave here, I'm going to peer into the crystal ball a little bit. Okay, and I'm going to ask for two more quantities. I'm going to ask for the flange width and d. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, why is he asking for that? Trust me, it'll make sense. What is D sub F? 6.5. And what about D? 7.93. There you go. So the depth should be about 8 inches. It won't be perfectly 8 inches, but if you look at all the WHs, the depths are around there. Make sense? Okay, now the only other thing I'm going to put here is I'm going to put, um, let's deal with the bolts real quick. So, so we have a bolt diameter of three quarters of an inch, and that implies what? The effective diameter is one eighth. There you go. So I'll, I'll, I'll be formal. I'll say the bolt diameter plus an eighth of an inch, which is seven eighths of an inch. Okay, all right. Okay, so we've got two limit states, right? We have gross section yielding and net section fracture. 
How do we compute the capacity according to gross section yielding? How do we do that? What's the formula for gross section yielding? All right, so 0.9 times Fy times Hg. Are we prepared to do that calculation right now? Do we have Fy? Do we have the gross area? Let's go ahead and do it. Okay, so gross section yielding. So, so a little bit about this notation. So I'm saying the nominal resistance, P sub N, times the resistance factor phi. And I say phi sub T since it's a tension member. We'll have phi sub B and phi sub C and all that. So phi sub C or phi sub T P N is 0 0.9 FY A G. And so all we're saying is that this is P N. That's phi t. Okay. So that equals 0 0.90 times 50 KSI times 7.08 square inches. Okay. So what do we get when we check that out? And, and by the way, we're dealing with like, you know, a kip is 1,000 pounds. So you don't need to carry this out to 15 decimal places. Like when you're dealing with kips, no more than two decimal places, I, I think, is fine. So, so what do we get for this? And usually I'll just do one. 318.6. Do I have a second? No. Okay. So what we're going to say is BPN. Here, I'll, I'll move it down here a bit. We'll say BPN is 318.6. And then what are the units? Say it again. Yes. Kips, right? Because we're taking a, a kips per square inch times the square inch, so this is kips. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of highlight this. And we're going to say here, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling too much. Gross section yielding. Right here. So in other words, um, if I apply load, if I take this tension member and I yank on it, I reach its limit according to gross section yielding when the load reaches this value. Okay, so that is a capacity according to this limit state. Okay, now that is the capacity according to gross section yielding. What is the formula for capacity according to net section fracture? It's not 0.9 FYAG. It's something else. What is it? 0.75 times FU times what? Net area. Times, all right. The 0.75 FU net area U. We have FU. We know that that's 65 KSI. Do we know the net area? No. Do we know the shear lag factor? No. So that's what we need to focus on. So let's take them one at a time. Let's start off with the net area. Okay. Okay. So net area. Okay. So I'm going to scroll up a little bit. So here's our member. So first off, we don't have any stagger, right? So we don't have to deal with stagger factors, right? Um, the, in general, the net area is the gross area minus the area lost due to the presence of bolt holes. We, um, we know the gross area. How many bolt holes are we going to be subtracting from this cross-section? Four, right? Because when we samurai sword or lightsaber through this, that's how many we've got, right? I mean, what's going on here is we've got you know, here's our situation you know, in 3D okay, and we're cutting through one two three, four so that's what we're subtracting so what's our formula? The net area is the gross area minus what? Four times what two quantities? Answer thickness and uh, diameter. You're both, yeah, you're both saying same Yes, that's right. So DETF. So that is, so what was the gross area? It was 7.08.
So 7.08 minus 4 times the hole diameter times the flange thickness, and we're going to get a value of 5.68. Okay. Do I have a second on that? Okay, so there's our net area. So the 0.75 FU times the net area times U. We have a shear lag factor, right? So now we need to start talking about our shear lag factors, okay? So let's go down here a little bit. Okay, so... Okay, so we need to find that shear lag factor table and watch this. Boom, found it. So again, um, this is where having the, uh, the bookmarks really do help. Now this is table th uh, D3.1. dash 16.1-34. See, when you use a manual for six years, it's like you remember the pages, but now that we have a new manual, I can't remember them off the top of my head, so i got to look it up. Okay, so the first question I always want you to ask whenever you're assessing a tension member and you look at shear lag is, are we dealing with case one or are we dealing with case two? So a question is, are we dealing with case one or case two? Which is it? Case two. Case two. And why case two? Exactly, only some of the cross-sectional elements are connected. We have the flanges connected, flange, 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 but not the web. The web is not connected. So we definitely are going to be dealing with case two. All right, now, before we move on, though, I want to see if there are any other cases that we should consider. Do we consider case three or case four? No, those are about welding. We're not welding this. What about five or six? Do we consider five or six? No, those are tubes and pipes. We don't worry about that. What about case seven? Yeah, it's a W section. And what does it say? Is it connected by the flange? Yep. So we're going to consider case two and case seven. Okay. So let's deal with them one at a time. Let's deal with case two and let's deal with uh, case seven. So case two, what we're going to need is we're going to need an X bar and we're going to need a connection length, okay? Now, my apologies, I'm going to scroll up for the connection length. Um, what is the connection length for this problem going to be? Three inches. Oh, let's talk about that. Is it, what is it? Nine. Nine inches. Remember, connection length is defined from center of bolt to center of bolt on the outside of the connection along its length, right? So the, the real kicker is that it's nine inches, it is not 11 inches, okay? We do not account for that two inches right there. It's three, six, and nine, okay? So the connection length is nine inches, okay? Now, this one's different. This one's our first time dealing with this. So we have a connection eccentricity, okay? Now, I told you last time that there was a special case for connection eccentricity that what we do is this. We say, all right, um, we have a section like this that's connected by the flanges, and it is a W8 by 24. When, and this is a very special case. Whenever you have a W section connected by the flanges, what we do is we sort of split it in half, and we ask ourselves, what is the Y bar for an equivalent WT, okay? Now, when we say equivalent WT, we are really talking about taking that W section and just slicing it right in half. So this WT is half as deep and half as heavy. So instead of a W8 by 24, we are looking up properties for a WT what? 4 by 12. And specifically what we are looking up is Y bar. So what is Y bar for a WT 4 by 12? 
0 0.695. Okay. And I'll just mention right here, you got that in table 1-8 on page 1 what? 71. 71. Okay, did everybody else find that? Everybody good? So it's 1 71, so I believe that's on the right. W, w sections, they have a lot more, uh, or W keys, they have you know, a lot more with that. So. Okay, everybody good? So therefore, U2 we're worried about the shear lag factor, not the band, is 1 minus x bar over L, which is, oh, that's inches, 1 minus 0 0.695 inches over 9 inches, which is what? 0 0.923. 923. And for shear lag, like no more than three decimal places, that's fine. So. Sound good? And what are the units for shear lag factors, by the way? There are none. It's dimensionless because you're taking inches over inches. Okay. All right. So let's go back to the very beginning. Okay, let's go back to the very beginning. What have we said? Net section fracture. How do we compute the shear lag fracture? We have 0.75 FU net area times U. Well, wait. We haven't finished U yet because we have another case to consider, right? We said case two, but what was the other case? Case seven. Let's look at case seven. Now, Let's open up the manual a little bit. Let's look at K7. What does it say with K7? So if we if we look at K7, we say, all right, we have first off the description of the element. So we have W, M, S, or HP shapes, or T's cut from these shapes. So essentially what it's saying is any I-shaped cross-section or any T-shaped cross-section where the it was cut from an I. Okay. Um, it also says if U is calculated per case two, the larger value is permitted to be used. So we're going to calculate a U2 and a U7 and take the bigger one. Okay? Now, with this case, we got a couple options. Now, the lower option says with the web connected with four or more fasteners. We don't have that, right? So we can ignore that bottom one. Now, the next one says with the flange connected with three or more fasteners per line in the direction of loading. Does our member meet that requirement? Yes. Yes. How many fasteners per line? Four, right? Right here, exactly right. Because per line in the direction. Because we're taking this tension member, we're taking this tension member and we're yanking on it like that. So in the direction of loading, one, two, three, four. So we definitely meet that, okay? Now, how do we determine what our shear lag factor is? What do we compare? We compare B sub F and two thirds of the depth. So you remember earlier I said, we're gonna need those values. I'm gonna look into the crystal ball and I'm gonna tell you we're gonna need them. Now you can see why we need them, right? So B sub F, remind me, what was B sub F again? 6.50. 6.50. All right. And then two-thirds of the depth is two-thirds of? 7.93. What is that? So if I had to compare B sub F and two-thirds of the depth, B sub F is bigger, right? That's bigger. And if that's the case, what is U7? Point 0.9. 0.9. Make sense? Okay. Well, if that's the case, then... What's our U value? Which U value are we going to use? The bigger one. Remember, we said if U is calculated per case 2, the bigger one's better to use. That's 0.923, that's 0.9. So therefore, U is going to be U2. 0 0.923. Everybody okay with that? All right, any questions? So now, net section fracture, 0.75 FU, net area, U. We've got every quantity. We can go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead. Um, everybody good? Do I need to stay here for a second? Okay. Scroll up a little bit. Give me a little bit more. Room. So 
So we now calculate another VPN, which is 0 0.75 FU net area times U, which is 0 0.75 times 65 KSI times, what was the net area again? What was it, 5.68? And then 0 0.923. Okay, so let's chug that out. Tell me what you get. So we'll round it to one decimal place, say 255.6. All right, so and units are kits, right? Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to we'll circle that. And we'll say that's net section fraction. Net section fracture. There we go. So um, one of the things that we need to do is we need to just ask ourselves, what's the capacity? Okay. Or the resistance, if you want to think of it like that. So we have a gross section yielding of, what was it, um, 318.6. And we now have a net section fracture of 255.6 kip. So the question is, um, which one, if I were to ask somebody, or somebody were to ask me, how strong is this element? What's my answer? Is it 318 or is it 255? 255. Because if I start loading it, I'm going to hit this number first before I hit that one. So what we say is we say that this governs and we say that VPN is 255.6 kips. Okay, that's the capacity. Um, but what do I do with that? Wait. Okay, that's the capacity. Now what? What was the goal of, of this whole exercise? The goal of the exercise is to determine whether or not the tension member that we're looking at, if it's safe or not. How do I determine whether or not this tension member is safe? How do I determine whether any element is safe? I compare what two quantities? The resistances and the, the loads, right? What were we given about the loads in this problem? We were given a service dead load of 80 kips and a service live load of 90. So we need to do something with those. So let's take a look at those. So, so now let's look at our factored loads. Okay, so we've been given a dead load of 80 kips and a live load of 90 kips. And these are the only two quantities that we've got, okay? So um, if we look at our available load combinations, we've got 1.4 dead 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. And these are really the only two that we need to check when all we're given is dead and live. Now, can anybody look at these and tell me, just based on the numbers we're given, which one that we really need to worry about? Do we really need to worry about checking one? No. I mean, because 1.4 times that is what, like a hundred something, like low hundreds, but just that's going to be less than if we just added these, right? So definitely load combination two is going to be the one that governs. So 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, therefore, PU, so I'm using that notation U to say it's an ultimate factored load. That's the common notation that we use, uh, is we say that that is 1.2 dead plus 1.6 lot, okay, which equals 1.2 times 80 kips plus 1.6 times 90 kips, and that's going to yield a PU of 240. Do I have a second on that? Okay. So, what observation can you make about this number? In general. So. Good enough for DOH. It, it's safe. The member is adequate. Okay. So, and I want to talk about something you just said a little bit ago, because um, I, I want to. I'm not going to get on my soapbox too much. But the answer is that the member is adequate. Okay, now you said something a little second. You said you're cutting it close. Um, I'd like to just comment on that a second. So you're right that if you look at these two numbers, they're very close. But let's think about the context in the background. This number is taking its fracture capacity and reducing it by 25%. Like we applied a resistance factor of 0.75. We took the live loads and increased them 60%. Like that's what we did here. We increased that 60%. We increased the dead loads 20%. So you say it's cutting it close, and what I'm saying is it would be cutting it close if there were no factors of safety applied, but the factors of safety are already built into that. So now that the factors of safety are there, it's like at some point we have to be able to say we want to get these numbers as close to each other as possible, right? So I'm saying that that's what these factors of safety are intended to do. So you do want to try and get these as close as possible. Now, what do I mean when I say as close as possible? I'm going to throw out a term right now, and I want everybody to do a quick calculation for me. I'm going to throw out a little term here called efficiency. So if I were to take PU over BPN, what would I get? I'd get 240 over this. Tell me what that is, like to say three decimal places. 0 0.939. 0 0.939. Everybody okay with that? I'll say or 93.9%. Okay? How many of you ever had a sick day in school and you found yourself in 11 o'clock watching the practice right? And the wheel, what's the thing about the wheel? When you spin the wheel, you get, you get a number, what, what's the thing about it? Can't get over what? One dollar? Anybody remember this? Sorry. I was a wheel of fortune guy. <laughs> You're a wheel. What's that? Night. They didn't, that's on the Okay. Okay. What I'm saying is that we want this number to be as close to what without going over? One, right? If this number, let's say we calculated our efficiency, we got an efficiency of 1.2, what would that mean? 1.2 would mean that the efficiency is greater than one, so it would mean that the load is bigger than the resistance, right? That would mean that the member is not safe, right? Make sense? So what that means is that Anytime this value is larger than one, the element is unsafe. We want it to be smaller than one. Now, what most steel designers will tell you is any number for tension members that's about 80 to 90%, like it's sort of like a grade in class. Like if you can get that number 90% or better, that's pretty good. Now, there, were, there are engineers out there who will say if it gets to like 99%, they might back it down a little bit just because. But if you're in this range, that's good. That's, a, that's an efficient design, okay? 
Um, you'll hear uh, building designers maybe call this term efficiency. You'll hear bridge engineers maybe call this a performance ratio. Okay, performance, it's, it's the same thing. Okay, a lot of software packages in bridge engineering will just list a bunch of limit states and list a bunch of performance ratios so that you can see what governed your design uh, and, and what have you. Okay, um, does that make sense? So we're going to use the term efficiency a little later, but as long as your efficiency is 80% or 90%, like, I'd say 90% or better, you're good. Now, if it's 88%, that's, that's probably fine too. But if your efficiency is like 40%, your member's way over design and you can probably do better. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Um, are we done or did we forget something? Slenderness. We didn't talk about slenderness. Let's talk about slenderness. Okay. So let's look at our slenderness check. Now, how long is this member? What did we say at the beginning? 40 foot. 40 foot. Ooh. Let's go ahead and convert that to inches right now. Um, when we're doing slenderness, um, 40 times 12 is 480. Now, we also need our, our men. which is the minimum of Rx and Ry. And I would guess I would say Rx, Ry, and Rz if there is one, but there isn't for a W shape. But for W shapes, that's always going to be Ry, which is 1.61 inches. Okay. That's my W shape. That is correct, yes. And the reason why, that's a very good question. The reason why is because we are at, this actually is a W shape, okay? When the uh, truck arrives to the site and the crane needs to pick up these members, it is picking up a W shape, it's not picking up a WT. The only reason that we use a WT for shear lag factors is because analytically, when we apply load via the flanges, we're assuming like half the load goes up top, half the load goes uh, uh, down to the bottom for a stress distribution standpoint. But this slenderness check is for like, handling it on the side and handling it in the fab shop. So we are actually physically picking up a W8 by 24, which is why we use the properties here for that, for that shape. Okay. So therefore what we're going to do is we're going to compute L over R, which is 480 inches over 1.61. And so what do we get when we do this? Actually, I'll put this over here. Okay. So L over R is 298.1. What does that mean? It's yeah, it is pretty close, but it's okay. It does meet the limit, okay? But it barely meets the limit. So what that would tell me as the engineer is that yeah, it meets the limit, but that's a little flimsy, you know what I mean? I mean, like I might tell the the or might if I got a number like this, it might be something where I might, you know, hey, is this going to be good or do you want the member to be a little stiffer? Because, it, again, if you've ever seen a piece of steel lifted by a crane or in a fab shop, if it starts to get slender, it starts to handle like a piece of wet spaghetti. You know what I mean? And so um, this is pretty slender. It's fine, and, there, and it does comply with the spec, but it's cutting it close. So we'll say that the member meets slenderness limits. By golly gosh, there's our problem. So um, I hope that, well, first off, let me take a step back. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? Has this been pretty straightforward? Hopefully it has been because I really like this lecture because we're not really covering a lot that's terribly new, but what we're doing is taking what we've been doing over the past couple weeks and trying to big picture, hey, here it is with the whole thing. I, I kind of like this. So we're looking at a tension member and assessing whether or not that member is safe in resisting load. Now, I guess my question for you is, what would you tell me? Let's think about this holistically. What would you say I need to do if this number is bigger than one or this number is bigger than 300? What do I need to do? Choose a large number. 
Exactly right. That's exactly right. I need to choose a larger W section. Now, one way could be I could reduce the load or something like that, but you're basically saying something's wrong. And so what that means is choosing another W section. But it goes to a larger uh, picture that maybe what we need to do is we need to figure out a way of choosing W sections, right? Because that's the whole purpose of design. I'm going to give you a, a connection scenario and a load, and I'm going to say find the lightest shape, okay? Now, we're going to get to that next week. I've got one more analysis problem I kind of want to do on... Um, on, on Friday because this is a really important skill and we're going to be doing analysis all this semester and I really want it to feel second nature so we're going to do another one. Um, before we do though, I want to at least highlight some things about your homework assignment that's going to be due on Friday. But any questions about this process in general? Okay. So um, Okay. So this is the member that I'm going to have you do the same thing about. So everything that we just did, we're going to do that to this. Okay. Now, a couple things about this. Number one, okay, this is not a W shape. Okay. I, I know I'm like, obviously it's not, but it's not a W shape. It's a channel. Okay. So I want you to recognize that if you just literally one-to-one -one repeat every step that we just did for this assignment, you will probably get the wrong answer. Okay. For a couple of reasons. One the bolts aren't going through the flange. They're not, okay? We've got some stagger maybe to consider. Maybe we need to consider stagger, maybe we don't. Um, we've got um, a channel, so it's gonna have different shear lag uh, states, okay? It's possible that it doesn't have enough capacity. It's possible that it does. It's possible that it meets slenderness limitations. It's possible, it's possible that it fails them. Um, I'm not telling you, you know, so I want you to analyze this, but recognize that maybe some of the little steps, the little details from point A to point B might be different because it's a different member. But we've handled stuff, the different pieces of this before. We've handled channels before. We've handled staggered connections before. So I want to see what you come up with, okay? Any questions? All right, I'm going to pull up the code one more time in case anybody missed it, and I will see you all on Friday.